Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I'm sure that you're all energized now. If not, that's okay. I'm going to do my best to make sure that you are. Uh, just to expound on a little bit of what Mr. Durr was saying, I am a retired. I want to make sure you all understand that. So I can't get you out of any tickets. You get arrested while you're here. This is not my jurisdiction. I was out in New York, so you're on your own. But I retired, thank you, 2013 and came back into the uniform because like many of you, I am a traditional guardsman up until next year, March, I'm retiring. So I'm gonna let somebody else take the reins and do this thing and I'm gonna go off into the sunset and enjoy my second retirement. So Army, Air, Air Force, Air Guard. I am actually quadruple had it, sir. I'm the program manager for senior leader training. Anybody ever heard of the LTAS? Leadership Team Awareness Seminar. I'm the program manager for that. I'm also the service liaison for the Air National Guard. I'm the service liaison officer for the active duty Air Force. And I'm also acting program manager for the reserve component course that some of you send your practitioners to to learn the business of equal opportunity. So that, those are all of the things that I do at DOMI. Uh, I have been in the field of diversity since 1999. Anybody remember Dr. Samuel Patansis? Yep. One of those few? All right. Remember EEO 2000? Colorado, anybody go to Colorado to get there? There you go, all right. I was one of those folks who got chose to go uh, to Colorado to get that training. Still got the VHS tapes and the cassettes sitting somewhere in my house. So I've been doing that since 1999. I was also the EEO compliance officer for the state police when I was with them. I served as a director out in the field in the Air National Guard as well as an EO director. So I've had the opportunity to stick around long enough to become relevant. That's what I like to tell people. All right, so as we're going through this morning, how many of you, or this afternoon, losing track of time, how many of you have taken a deox or are familiar with a deox? Okay, who has not taken the deox? Don't worry, because I'm not gonna teach you how to do the deox. That's so you're good, that's, that's, right. Good. that's right. That's okay. Yes, yes, client assessment, all right? So I'm not going to teach you the deox, all right? I'm not the deox subject matter expert. But what I am an expert on is how to utilize this deox as it pertains to diversity. Because it is with, in my humble opinion, that I truly believe that in order to measure diversity properly, you cannot do it through metrics. That's old data. Those are things that have happened in the past. In order to assess or measure diversity, you have to do it utilizing real-time data. That's the only way that you're going to be able to assess it properly. Other than that, you're actually, what most people are doing, and I've done plenty of them, you're actually putting together an affirmative action plan when you're doing metrics. That's what we did as civilians. Calculating the numbers of people who went to classes, how many complaints they had, where the demographic breakdowns were in the organization, those are actually affirmative action reports. They're not necessarily diversity reports. But I will tell you, the military has a secret weapon and it's the DOX. Now, they don't know it yet, but come March when I retire, they'll know it because I actually use this out in the field, not this particular, but an assessment similar to this to gauge diversity because it's active and I'll show you what that means here in a minute. So as we push forward, today what I'm gonna talk about is the importance of the DOX, other than why we have to do it because it's mandated by Congress. I'm gonna talk about why is it important for you all as leaders to understand this DOX. First, before we do that though, I'm gonna define diversity as I see it. And I'll explain to you what that means as I see it as we go along. Then I'm gonna show you some deox factors and how those things relate to that active process of diversity. And then I'm gonna end by talking about what leadership needs to do with that deox brief at the end when you're finished. All right? So before I get started, I'd just like to take a moment and some of you may have seen this already, and I apologize for this being so blurry, but did anybody get a chance to see this letter that came out from the Secretary of Defense, October 5th, 2017? It's okay if you didn't because I brought it along, all right? 
So I'm going to read to you what this says because I think this is really the driver for what we're doing here for these next two days. So it says, the start of a new fiscal year serves as an opportunity for greater alignment as we reconfirm our commitment to America. As members of the U.S. Department of Defense, you play a vital role in supporting the three million men and women, uniformed and civilian, who fight our nation's interests abroad. We protect and defend the Constitution, our people, and our values, and America's military reinforces traditional tools of diplomacy, ensuring President Trump and our diplomats negotiate from a position of strength. We are a department of war. We must be prepared to deal with an increasingly complex global security situation characterized by an accelerating decline in the management of the rules-based international order. North Korea's provocative actions and reckless rhetoric continue despite United Nations censure and sanctions. Russia has violated the borders of nearby nations and seeks, to veto, seeks veto power over the economic, diplomatic, and security decisions of, it, of its neighbors. China is a long-term strategic competitor that seeks to intimidate its neighbors by escalating tensions in the South China Sea. Iran continues to sow violence and remains the largest long-term challenge to Middle East stability. Despite recent gains against ISIS, terrorist groups continue to murder the innocent and threaten peace. Pursuit of global security and stability requires our armed forces to remain the world's preeminent fighting force, and our department has three lines of effort to enable us to remain the world's preeminent fighting force. Let's go over these. Number one, first, restore military readiness as we build a more lethal force. We will execute a multi-year plan to rapidly rebuild the warfighting readiness of the joint force, filling holes in the capacity and lethality while preparing for sustained future investment. This line of effort prioritizes a safe, secure nuclear deterrent, the fielding of a decisive conventional force, and retains irregular warfare as a core competency. Number two, Second, strengthen alliances and attract new partners. Alliances and multicultural or multinational, excuse me, partnerships provide avenues for peace, fostering conditions for economic growth with countries sharing the same vision. Strong alliances also temper the plans of those who would attack other nations or tries to impose their will over the less powerful. History is compelling on this point. Nations with strong allies thrive while those without stagnate and wither. We will continue to work with our allies, partners, and coalitions, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, the Defeat ISIS Coalition, and others to reinforce the safety and security that underpins peace and economic prosperity for all nations. Number three. Third. Bring business reforms to the Department of Defense. This line of effort instills budget discipline and effective resource management, develops a culture of rapid and meaningful innovation, streamlines uh, requirements and acquisition processes, and promotes responsible risk taking for personal initiative. Personal initiative. We're going to harp on this a little bit as we go along. Some specific re Re reforms are already in progress, such as congressionally mandated creation of the chief management officer and realignment under the Secretary of Defense for acquisition, technology and logistics, as well as the department's preparation for its first full scope financial audit fiscal year 2018. Others are forthcoming as we seek to modernize the defense travel system, protect our infrastructure and intellectual property, improve information technology, business operations, efficiency, and implement real cost of county. I expect you to pursue these three lines of effort. Set discipline goals, collaborate across components, and model appropriate ethical behavior. Remember, attitudes are caught from those who set the example. Use your force of personality to lead with a sense of urgency and purpose every day. 
so that we leave this department in even better shape for those to follow. That's from the Secretary of Defense. I wanted to take time to read that because really that states the case for why we talk about diversity within the Armed Forces and Department of Defense. It's about resources. Everything that was stated in that letter can only be accomplished by who? People. That's it. Planes don't fly. Artillery does not hit its spot without us. And for its leaders, for you all, the key is to tap into the potential of every single person to accomplish your mission, task, and goals. That's what diversity should be about. All right, so this is straight from the top. This is where our guidance comes from. So before we get started, let's talk about why is the DOX important in the first place? Here's one. So everything I talked about within that long statement describes this. If people are our most important asset, then the job for leaders is how do you get the best out of each and every individual? So I asked the other classes, how many of you in here have cell phones? Everybody? Rotary phones don't count. You gotta be real cell phones. So if I ask you all right now, how many of you know exactly how many apps and programs are on your cell phone? Could you tell me without looking at your manual? Probably not. People are the same way. See, that cell phone has a lot of power and ability, but it's only as good as the end user. So if you only know that there's a certain amount of apps on that phone, those are the only things that you're going to use, the things that have commonality to you. But what about the other ones that are in there that you never look at, that may even save your life, but you've never taken the time to go through that phone and see what that phone's capabilities are? So therefore, you're not utilizing that phone to its full capabilities. People are the same way. How many of you have deployed? That's an app. How many of you had a civilian job outside of being in the guard? You created apps. Every one of your experience has created a unique app that you have within your hard frame. And the only way for me as a leader to get to that app is figure out how to use it. If I can't get to those apps, I will never utilize you to your full capacity. That's your job as a leader to figure out how to get to my apps. Figure out how to get to that state police experience and all of those things that I've had out there to utilize them for your mission. Is everybody tracking? That's what diversity should be about. And that's why the DOX, if we're talking once again about people, this is your assessment to figure out how are those people functioning within that environment? Have I created a, an environment where these people can capitalize and work to the best of their ability? Here's another one for you. The survey has created a cultural shift. So how many of you in here have been in the military or been familiar with the military for 20 years or more? Okay. So ma'am, I'd like to ask you this. When you went through basic training, did your TI or drill instructor, if you were in the Army, did they ever come up to you and say, hey, you know, I know I yelled at you yesterday, but how do you feel about that? <laughs> did I hurt your feelings? You want to tell me how it made you feel? Did they ever do that? Did you think about it, though, when they yelled at you? You did? All right. But you never said anything about it, right? No, why not? It was expected. Say that again. It was what? I heard somebody up here say it. Part of the game. Part of the game, meaning what? That's our culture, right? Suck it up. That's right, suck it up. If we wanted you to have feelings, we would have issued them to you, right? That's our motto. But listen, folks, the minute you start asking me how I feel about something, you have just changed the culture. All right? You've changed the culture, but nobody prepared you for it. We just said, hey, you got to do these surveys now, which some of us were doing them already. But now, guess what? It's mandatory. And oh, guess what? We're going to hold you accountable. You just change the culture. All right? The minute you ask me how I feel, there's a level of expectation that I need to answer truthfully. 
So what happens if I'm in your unit now? Something happened to me two years prior, but it still affects me today when I go to sit down in front of that computer to take that survey. What do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? I'm going to tell you right now how I feel today at this particular time, right? Not about two years ago. It says, how do you feel today, right now? That's real-time data. The reason why you all need to know it, because that's going to affect my performance. In the military, I don't care who you are in here, we all have to comply with some sort of order. So when we come to work, me doing my job or completing a task, that's not anything to hang your hat on. I have to comply. But what I don't have to do is commit. So if I don't have to commit, all you're going to get out of me is a job done, but there's no well in front of it. Are you all tracking? I'm going to do the minimum. I'm going to do what needs to be done to get the job, to get you off my back, and move to the next. But is that really what we want? Is that really what you want out of an organization? I would probably say not. I would probably guess that you want a little bit more out of me than just accomplishing a task. All right? So that's why these surveys become important, because now they change the culture by asking my information, my input. Now that means you all have to do something with it. Here's the next one. This particular DOX has become your human relations climate assessment tool. It always has been. In the Air Force, we had unit climate assessments that we did. Anybody in here take a unit climate assessment? I think Army has too, right? OK. So for those of you who've taken a unit climate assessment, who was actually managing that unit climate assessment? Say again. EO. Say it louder, Captain. EO. EO managed that. It wasn't just anybody out there in the unit. That was EO's material, so to speak. And what else happened with that unit climate assessment? We did an in brief, we did a mid brief, and an in brief. You all ever experienced any of those? So you had three briefings for that unit climate assessment. So I am walking you all all the way through that assessment at each stage as an EO practitioner. You have me right there by your side. But that's gone now because of the number of times we have to do the deox, and we're spread so thin as practitioners that you just don't have enough EOAs or EO folks out there to do that for you. So guess what happens, end users? you all have to become smarter on human relations yourself because now you have to manage that or fill that gap that we used to fill. Now, I'm going to tell you all this. How many of you know that you have EO practitioners out there to help you with this? Okay, I don't see enough hands because everybody's hands should go up. If you don't know and they've been sitting back hiding, I just, I just told on them. Those folks should be helping you with this because they're the subject matter experts. I can tell you right now, if you send a major, and, they, and, and, and we do, you send a major to the OMI for 11 weeks, that's over $50,000 for a major. The Army sends lieutenant colonels and a lot of them. That's a lot of money. So if I'm a CEO of a company and I'm throwing out 50 grand to train someone and now I'm not using them, that's not good business. That's what those folks are there to do. And if they're not doing the job right, you fire them and you get somebody else. Because that's their role. That's what you're paying them to do. So if I came right now and I said to each and every one of you, sir, what is your role right now in the military? In your position, what do you do? What's your responsibility? I'm the HREO for Oregon. HREO for Oregon. Rogers. Okay. Ma'am, what's your responsibility in your position that you're in right now? Military. Say again? Military, Military yes. Oh, I'm a G1 from the 184th Division. Okay, G1. What's your responsibility, sir? Human Resource Advisor. Human Resource Advisor. All right. Now, that's the micro. I want you all to start thinking on the macro. Sure, everything that you all said is correct. But each and every one of us in this room, whether we're wearing this or whether we're wearing those uniforms, our job is national security. That's our macro, is national security. So even me doing diversity and equal opportunity, my job is still national security. But I have a small piece of the puzzle, which is this. 
to ensure that you all get the right information when it comes to diversity and equal opportunity, but that's my small piece of a bigger piece of the puzzle. We all are in here for national security. So on the macro, when I'm out and I'm training people, I'm not training them for that class today. I'm training them for national security because I want to make sure that they're functioning properly so they get the most out of their people when they're deployed, when they're wherever, to accomplish their task. So go from the micro, or the macro, I'm sorry, down to the micro, your specific job that you do every day. And it will help you to focus in on how you want your DOCs to come out because now you're going to start telling your people what their mission is, what their bigger mission is, what their responsibility is within that big mission. Everybody tracking? All right, so this is your leadership human relations climate tool. However, in order to use this for diversity, we have to define what diversity is and what it looks like. And here it is right here. Diversity is an active process which requires full engagement from employers to employees and employees back to their organizations. See, this is not a one-sided thing. So if you hire me to come in to do a job, don't you expect me to do it? I guess not. Well, this is just a quiet group. So I can just come to work since you all don't really expect me to do it. And I can just sit around all day, right? Well, let's look at it this way. So now for my diversity practitioners, they hate when I go here, but I want you to hear this logic. So if we continue to look at diversity by demographics alone, counting the number of minorities we have, the number of women, all this, that, and the other, then no one should get mad at me if I show up to work and just stay black all day. Because that's all you hired me to do. You just wanted my demographic, right? What about my talents and skill sets? Because I promise you, if you hire me for those, my blackness will come with it. You'll get that demographic part of it for sure. But you're missing the other parts when we just focus on demographics. Because my demographics didn't make me become a state trooper. They didn't get me standing here in front of you. My work, my ethics did. Everything else came along for the trip. So when you get people on the team, it's not enough to say, hey, we got them. Okay, what are you going to do with them now? All right? What are you going to do with them while they're there? Because if not, and you get people on the team and you don't utilize them, you're actually creating a problem more so than helping. All you're doing is creating more EO complaints and all that kind of stuff because you haven't learned to work together. Is everybody tracking? We got to get beyond the demographics. We've gotten that part down so far. We understand that. But what else can you do with it as it pertains to this? And if you look right up there in the center of that top part of that definition, it says attaining optimal performance. How can you obtain optimal performance from someone if you don't know what talents they have? What skill sets they have? You can't. So you have to get to know me a little bit to know what I can bring to the table. And like many of you, I'm sure you have experienced this, have you ever gone to someone or just say customer service? You've gone somewhere and you ask someone a question and before you finish asking them, they've already answered it for you because they gave you the book answer, but it wasn't what you really needed. But they didn't take time to listen. They just figured they knew what you wanted. So you leave that person and go ask someone else who's not even in that career field or not even in that profession. They give you the answer. Had nothing to do with that profession, but they listened to you and they gave you what you wanted. I've got more stuff that way than going to an office of responsibility. So if we don't figure out how to obtain optimal performance out of people, we are still at the compliance level, not the commitment. We want to get people to that commitment level. So that, sir, if you leave the office and I work for you, the shop should still run. If you leave, sir, your second and third and fourth should be able to still carry that work on without you being there. Because if your second, thirds, and fourths aren't starters, better get somebody else. That means you're working too hard. Because they're not doing anything until you come around. All right? But you can only get that if you get my optimal performance. 
So moving beyond this demographics, this brings us to this. Diversity is expressed by what I call the functional equation. The functional equation. And that equation is this. Representation plus inclusion plus performance equals diversity. If you remove any one of those parts, you do not have diversity. If you move, remove inclusion, you're left with compliance performance at the minimal level. You remove uh, inclusion out of there, you take performance out of there, you're left with simply representation. You are not, you don't have diversity, you're actually diverse. And there's a difference. There's a difference between being just diverse and having diversity. The first one is simply affirmative action. That's all representation is without inclusion in performance is affirmative action. Affirmative action does not require performance. Okay? The only way you get to this here, synergy, is by using these things together, and they must function together at the same time. They can't stand alone. Now, my diversity counterparts also hate when I say this, but I'm, I'm okay with it at this stage of the game. I've been doing it long enough that I feel confident in it. If you ever see me do a presentation anywhere or hear me speak, you never hear me saying diversity and inclusion. I never use that phrase. Because you can't have diversity without inclusion. You can't. You're just diverse if you remove inclusion. And then that gives us what we call the Noah's Ark brand of diversity. You meet two blacks, two Hispanics, two white males, two women, diversity. Check, we got it. No, you don't. You just got an eclectic group of people. How well do they function together? All right? I've been to some of the most diverse organizations in the country. And they never call me because they need representation. They call me because they can't work together. Because there's a cultural breakdown between those groups where they are scared to talk to each other. I've been to places where you have one group who is scared to discipline another group because of their demographic makeup. You all ever experienced that? I see some heads, don't worry, I'm not gonna point you out. But you know I'm telling the truth. Hey, why'd you close the door on that person, but you didn't close it for this person? Oh, well, I don't want to be behind closed doors with A, B, or C because there may be an assumption that I'm doing this. Well, what if that person decides to file a complaint now because you treated them differently? They got a case. They certainly got a good argument. All right? So if you're going to be consistent in what you're doing, be consistent across the board. And I always like to say, you know, you judge people and treat them based on their merit. Other than that, if you come to see me and somebody ever files a complaint on you because of that kind of stuff, all I'm going to do is ask you the right questions. The first thing I'm going to ask you, sir or ma'am, do you have any documentation on this person? That's the first thing I'm going to ask you. What kind of documentation? Well, have you progressively disciplined this person all the way up? And do you have something to show me where you did that? If you tell me yes, you're in the ballpark. If you tell me no, and now all of a sudden you're trying to throw the Rico statue at that person because they didn't tease you off so bad, now you got to go back to the drawing board. But as long as you're doing what you're supposed to do, don't worry about complaints, folks. They're going to happen. I've had complaints filed against me in my EO capacity. I'm still here. All right? Do your job. Don't worry about that stuff. It's going to happen. If you're in this business long enough or you're a leader long enough, you're going to get complaints. People are complaining about you anyway, whether you know it or not. That was just on paper. You just so happen to know about it. So that's how you're going to create that synergy, by having these three things working together. Without these three working together, you have no synergy. Therefore, you have no diversity within your organization. So if you want to measure it, measuring, or it requires you to assess that organizational effectiveness by collecting real-time data. That data I was telling you about me sitting in that, in that seat and telling you how I feel right now. Because that is going to affect your mission readiness. And the DOCS is the proper tool for measuring 
diversity. And let me show you how. This is the new 4.1. Most of you who have taken the DOX are still on the 4.0, so you're getting your results back from that. This one is out right now. So those new commanders, new leaders, you're going to be seeing this one, the 4.1. It's a little bit more streamlined. There's only about 50 questions tailored a little bit more specifically to get to the end state and get to your goals. But if you look at these factors here, you have the organizational effectiveness factors, you have those retaliation factors, EO and fair treatment factors, and then the SAPR, SAPR factors. But let's take a look at the organizational effectiveness factors, and we'll see how this relates to the diversity I just described to you all. Sorry about that. All right. So what's that number one question? What does it say? I feel like part of the family. What sort of question is that? If you look at that functional equation I just gave you all, what kind of question is that, that question there? Inclusion. Say again? Inclusion. Inclusion. There we go. All right. We're tracking. What about number two? This work group has a great deal of personal meaning to me. What would you think that one is? Say again? Inclusion, right? Because now you feel you had to get, have something to feel that you're a valuable part of that work group or that work group is valuable to you. So let's skip down to number six under senior leadership. My senior leader communicates a clear vision for the future. What kind of question is that? Actually, you can have two or three questions in the same question. So, say again? I'd say inclusion and performance. Inclusion and performance, okay. Inclusion how? You're included in the vision, you share the vision, or she shares okay. the vision with you. Okay, there you go. And, what, and, and how so on performance? So you can align around the vision. Okay. All right, so you got a clear vision, therefore you can perform your goals much clearer. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. So let's move down real quick to organizational performance. When short suspense tasks arrive, people in my organization do an outstanding job in handling these situations. What kind of question do you think that one is? Says performance, but what else could be there? Say again, sir? Inclusive. Inclusive, right? Absolutely. So when you're looking at these questions, start asking yourself, what type of question is this? I mean, literally, when it comes to diversity, ask yourself, what kind of question am I looking at? Because that's going to help you identify your weaknesses. Now you can correct some of those things because you know what type of question it is. You know what category it fits in. So if that's an inclusion question, OK. How can we include that person? Where would I start? Well, maybe I need to start looking at how we communicate my policies if I'm the leader. How are those policies going out to the rest of the masses? Are they getting down to the lowest rungs of the organization? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe they're not being articulated the way they should be. And who's doing those briefings? Who's giving that information? It will help you identify where those cracks are, all right? So that's for the organizational effectiveness. Same way with these. These are pretty obvious, but I'm going to skip to some that aren't as obvious. We're going to skip right through these. All right, we're going to go here, and I'm going to ask you all a scenario question before I go into this. So let's say, for instance, I work for you all, and I come in and I say, hey, I've been sexually harassed in this organization. Now, as we look at diversity as that functional equation, where do you think the ramifications are going to come from as it pertains to that functional equation if I'm suffering from sexual harassment? What do you think is going to happen to me? Performance, right? OK. Now, I tell everyone once again, don't be fooled by people in the military being able to do their job under some stiff circumstances. That's what we train to do. So don't mix that up with, oh, well, the person seemed like they're okay. They were doing their job. We have to do our job. That's what we train to do. But is that person committed? Are they giving you their best? Can they give you their best under those circumstances? And here's another one. What is our tolerance level in the military for sexual harassment? Zero, Zero right? 
So if I'm the only one that you know of that's suffering from sexual harassment, I'm actually being excluded. I'm being excluded from that sexually harassment free environment. And everybody else is free from having to deal with that. Do you think you're going to get commitment from me? Especially if you're not dealing with it, if you're not addressing it. And I can tell you right now as being a cop and being in the military, each and every one of you, I'm sure, has dealt with situations that challenge your moralistic beliefs. I'm sure you have. Policies have come out that maybe you just, hey, I, I don't believe in this. However, what do you have to do? Got to execute, right? You have to execute. So people are going through these things, and you need to know it. You don't have to agree with their situation, but you need to know that they're going through it so that you can help them get to their optimal performance. That's what this is all about, is performance. Diversity should always, always end with performance. Always. Because other than that, you're only talking about representation. You're only talking about affirmative action-based diversity. You're not talking about an active process. And diversity is an active process which requires hands-on engagement every single day to make it work, all right? So this is not as obvious, but when you look at sexual assault, all right? So when I come in now, and now it's not being sexually harassed, but I come in and tell you that I've been sexually assaulted. I walk in your office and I tell you that. What do you all have to do now? So sir, I walk into your office, First thing Monday morning, I hit you with, sir, I've been sexually harassed or sexually assaulted. What do you have to do? What, how is your day going to go from that point on? Not very good. Not very good. Is it going to change your priorities? Because a lot of this stuff is time sensitive, right? So now I've just come in and I've had this happen to me. I put this on your desk. It changes your whole priorities. What about if you're getting ready to deploy and I walk in and tell you that? Does your deployment stop? What happens to me if I'm supposed to deploy? Does mine stop? See, these are questions that you all have to think about now. Mine may have stopped before I walked in the office. What if I happen to be one of those vital team players? Say that again. I'm glad you all didn't go for that one. You said it doesn't matter, sir, and why does that not matter? Because the damage, irreparable damage caused by not dealing with the issue is more important by factor 10, 100, than it is worrying about, you know, because everybody should be indispensable. You're, you, we can always replace you. That's right. Yeah. Yep, you absolutely. You replace the damage to the organization. Right, absolutely. And let me tell you something. I know you all probably have seen this. If you haven't, please go out to YouTube and take a look at it. Did you all see a few weeks what happened in the Air Force Academy when the general came on? Shut it down. Everybody, come on in here. We need to talk. Dealt with it quickly and swiftly. Now, I'm going to tell you what the streets say. What I mean by the streets or what that does for people outside that the gentleman was referring to that small group of potential military members, that, done, that, that right there, that did more for recruiting than any other thing we could have possibly done. To see a general stand up and say, listen, this is my ship. We don't get down like this. And if you don't like it, what did he say do? Get out. Get out. I'm telling you, after I heard him say it, I jumped up. I was like, sign me up. But I realize I'm about to retire, so it's more like sign me out. I'm gone. But let me tell you, to see that happen, to see somebody stand up as a leader and say, I'm going to face this thing head on. It's uncomfortable. You think that wasn't uncomfortable for that general to stand up there and talk about that? Yeah, but what did he do? Matter of fact, he said, you all take out your phones. I, I want you all, since you all want to use YouTube, we'll show you how to use social media in the military. This is how we use it. And he put that out there, and I believe that it was strategic. I do believe in his heart that's what he felt, but he knew what he was doing. He knew that if somebody wrote that on that board, he had a problem that existed that he only saw a little bit of. 
That's just the end result. He said, no, I know if, 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 if somebody's going to write this on the board, there's some other issues. So I'm going to stamp all of that out early. And I'm going to let those people know on the outside that if you come here, I got your back. You know what that means to a junior person or a person that's never been in your organization? That's where your recruiting comes from. That's how you attract people into your organization is by standing up and doing those things. And I'll just give you a, another real quick one before I move forward. When I was a young lieutenant, the one thing that my commanders did to a person, I went through about five of them. When I was coming up, they would force me to go to staff meetings as a lieutenant. And I, for the life of me, did not know why they were making me go to these staff meetings. Because I'm thinking, like, I'm a lieutenant. I have no say-so in here. I'm not going to get to talk to anybody, so why am I sitting here on the side listening to this? But as I kind of grew up through the ranks, I saw what they were doing. See, we talk about mentorship sometimes, and we wait on these formal programs to be designed so that now somebody has to tell us to mentor someone. They were mentoring me without even telling me. Because by putting me in those meetings, guess what I got to see? I got to see how decisions were made. I got to see who had the power in the organization, because you know guard units are, are different sometimes. <laughs> okay? But I got to see the players. I got to see how decisions were made, who had the power, and it gave me face time. So everyone knew that a lieutenant is not walking into these meetings on his own. So they knew I had a co-signer before I came in. So that gave me face time, and that was that, hey, listen, this is my EO person right here. Make sure you do the right thing. He didn't have to say anything else. Just make me show up. So what that did for me, it helped me become a better leader. It helped me to see the culture of my organization, and it showed me how to be a more senior officer by them just inviting me to meetings. That's something small. But it's big to a first-generation everything. I'm first-generation law enforcement first generation military officer. I didn't have a blueprint, but he did that, and they did that for me. So guess what I do? I do the same thing. They didn't do it based off of color or none of that stuff. They said, listen, we chose you to do this position. You're going to be the subject matter expert, but we really need to let you know what the organization is about. That's one of the best things they could have done for me as far as mentorship from a leadership standpoint, all right? Do you think, going back to some of those questions I just showed you, now you ask me that question. What do you think I would say? Do you feel like you're a valued part of that team? What do you think my response is going to be? Well, they don't put H-E-double-L -L on there. So I would be like, yes, I absolutely am. When it comes to the short answer questions, I'm going to elaborate on why I feel part of that organization. So now when you go to look at that DOX, you can see what you're doing right. You all tracking? It's little things like that, that as a general, colonels, you all don't have time to do all of this stuff that I'm doing. You just don't have time. I know you don't have time. As a major, I don't have time to do half the stuff I do. So I know you all don't have time to move this priority over, bring this priority in, even though you're trained to do that. But that's not how we get the optimal performance from you all as leaders either. As your subordinate, I need to make sure I'm watching your six so that you're getting the information that you need so you don't step on the booby traps. That's my job, and I'll do that for you if I'm committed. If I'm not, anybody heard of broken window, window syndrome? You break one window in an abandoned building, and you leave it. Next, somebody else comes and throws one. Nobody's going to fix it anyway. Next thing you know, spray paint. That's what happens to your organizations. But if you give people the opportunity to blossom, they'll watch your back. Trust me, they will. They'll do everything in their power because they like working for you, so they want to make sure you stay around. All right? So those are the things that's going to go in your DOX, and it's measured by what you do with your folks when you have the opportunity to do it. Right here, this is another part of that representation that I explained to you all in the RIP version of diversity. The DOX is already broken out for you. 
It's got all your demographics. It's got your percentages. It's got all of that stuff. So that shows your representation. We just talked about all of those, those questions that were inclusion questions and performance questions. Those go right along with diversity. So now you're able to track it. You have it. You're going to get your responses from those groups. So you'll be able to identify, OK, where are we failing with this particular group? Now, you all should know this, and I'm sure you probably do. This is only going to give you an answer. The whys come from conducting focus groups. You all don't have time to conduct focus groups. That's why you call us. Us, meaning EO practitioners. So if you have a DOX and you have answers on that DOX and you need to figure out why are we having these issues, conduct focus groups. All you need to do is call your EOA, EOL, or your EO practitioner and say, hey, listen, Gary, we want to conduct a focus group in our organization. Can you come over and, and set that up for Now, I will tell you, we at Diomi used to do those for you all. You could call us up and say, hey, I would like to, since I don't want to get anybody in my unit involved, I would like you all to come out and take a look at this and do a focus group. We used to do that. Don't anymore. Hopefully, it'll come back because I thought it was a good service for you all to actually have us since we control the thing to actually come out and assist you with that. But your EO practitioners will help you with that. And they will calculate all that data and give you a report at the end of it. If you have any issues doing that, you all contact me at Diomi. I'll make sure you get it done. All right? Some of you may be out there without an EOA or an EO practitioner. If that's the case, you all need to get on the horn to HRC and say, hey, we need this person because you're supposed to have them. Send us one. They'll send them down to Diomi, get them trained, and send them right back to you. But if you have any issues, call me and let me know. Right here, this is what you all used to get in the end brief from the EO folks. This is your almost kind of like your executive summary of your DOCs. But these are recommendations that will come from the survey. If you look over to the left, I know that's probably hard for you all to see in the back. But up there at the top, it says excellence or adequate. We don't want to just give you the negative. We want to give you the positive. Why? Because if you're already doing some things that are good, you may need to focus on those more and memorialize them somewhere, make it an SOP or something so that you can carry that on. But if you look over to the right, this is a much more detailed synopsis. These are red flag issues. And because your EO practitioners aren't there to tell you in person, we put it in writing but you can get both. So don't just look at this and say, I'm gonna handle this thing myself. I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna you know, set the world on fire. Get some help from your EO practitioners. Pay a lot of money to send them down to get them trained, they can help you. So that's what you'll get at the end. And then, leaders, I highly suggest that you brief that DOX at the end. What do I mean by briefing? I'm not talking about standing up there for a whole hour discussing the DOX in detail. I would suggest that you pick out the top two or three issues within your DOX. And when you go to brief your folks, you simply tell them, hey, we just finished out the DOX. We noticed that recognition was one of our low marks. Here's what we plan to do to mitigate that issue. Because I'm sure you all probably know anybody can write an award for anyone. I don't have to be a person supervisor. I don't even have to be in your same organization to write an award for someone. Those things can happen. But you have some people out there that don't even require a formal award. All they require is a pat on the back. Hey, good job. I like what you did. Yeah, sure, you got to come to work, but I like the way you did what you did. Keep trucking. And that's enough for them. There's some people, they don't care about those awards and stuff. But acknowledgement, recognition, can be formal or informal. Formulate a plan to address those concerns. And guess what? It may be a time to solicit some information from your unit, from your people. They're the ones that have boots on the ground. They know what the problems are. Let them give you what they want to happen. As long as it's within the playing field, rules, regulations, and policies, why not? Now they have a vested interest in your vision because you've included them. So just ask. You got some smart people in those operations. Get, get something out of them. Tap into those apps. Next, 
address the less, com less complex issues first. I can go in units, and I used to, I used to be on the IG team when we used to go around and inspect the offices and bases and all that stuff. And I would meet people who had been on that base or been in that unit for 20 years, and they would say, this has always been a problem. And I asked myself, well, if it was, it's been a problem for 20 years? Yep. Anybody try to address it? Nah, maybe, maybe not. And it's a easy, it's a grounder. And I'm like, wow, if you would just take care of that little problem, that little one, and then once you take care of it and you do those things, go back to your folks, maybe in an email. You don't ne necessarily have to have a formal meeting for that. And say, hey, listen, we have uh, done these things here to address this issue. Show them that they've spent their time doing something. If you have to sit there and give an hour of your life that you're never going to get back, use it for something. All right. Next, make it a practice to advocate for that diversity that we just talked about or I just talked about with you all earlier. This is your opportunity to talk about inclusion, because if you don't have inclusion, you don't have diversity. You are just diverse. That's it. All right. This is not the NFL or the NBA where just because you're on the team, everybody gets a ring if you win the Super Bowl. Everybody's valuable. Like the general said, you can't count somebody out simply because they're ranked. They're there for a reason. So utilize them. Make sure that you do those things, and I guarantee you that Deox, you'll get more participation, number one. You'll get more people being honest about it once they see you taking action. They'll start being honest with you, and guess what? They'll be honest with you before the Deox comes around. Actually, the Deox is too late if you think about it. I would rather have somebody come in my office and tell me about an issue than to go on paper. Because you know what other people do? If they don't go on this paper, they go to the newspaper. So they're going to talk because we've changed the culture. We've just told them by soliciting your input, we want to know how you feel. And if we don't tell them, we don't give them the answers, they're going down to NBC, MSNBC, Fox, and whoever else, and they're going to tell their story. Now it's out of your hands. Now somebody else liked the Deox. That's how we got the Deox mandated to us anyway. All right? So these are some of the things you all need to do, and this is how you should use that Deox to measure your diversity. So in conclusion, I talked about the importance of the Deox, talked about diversity defined, some deox factors, and how you all should use that deox and do it in brief at the end so that you let your people know that, hey, listen, we're invested in this with you. We're part of the team. We have any questions about anything that I've discussed here in the last, I don't know how many minutes. Any questions? If they're deox specific questions, you can bring them to me, but I'm going to refer you to our subject matter experts at Diomi because they can answer all of those questions for you and maybe even send you an email or something. But if you want to know how any of this works for those who didn't raise their hand, all you have to do is go to our website, which is www.diomi.org. And within our website, you can go right into the climate assessment. We have one uh, menu just for the Deox. You can go in there and practice it. You can go in there and look at questions. You've seen it, sir? You go in there, you can mess around with it. It shows you those locally developed questions. It even tells you how to do an in brief. It gives you everything you need. So if you don't have an EOA, you at least have that. Yes, ma'am. Got a question on the floor. The question was, is how often do we reassess the questions in the DOX? I can tell you that one, that they do that annually. Those, those questions are always assessed. And then we look at the way, for those of you who have taken it, have you seen the locally developed questions? And you have some short answer questions where you all can tailor those specific to your organizations. That's what you use those for. All right, so if the questions here don't get down to what you need, then you develop your own questions, and that EO practitioner can come in and help you do those too. Great question. Any other questions? Do you have any diversity? Oh, hold on just a second. Yes. Do you have any diversity practitioners? You keep saying EO. Yes. 
Her question is, do you have, do, does the OMI have any diversity practitioners? Yeah, helping with these assessments. Are you a diversity or EO? I'm both, man. Okay. But Certified in both. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Right. Absolutely. Sure yeah, absolutely. Oh, no. No, it's, it's, it's completely different. In fact, I wrote a book that will be out in two weeks, and I explained it in the book, the difference. Clearly defined it. I, I, that, well, they'll be the readers. Whoever buy it, you'll understand. You'll see. In fact, I break all of it down. Affirmative action, equal opportunity, EEO, and diversity, because all three of them are different. All right? So that's just practitioner talk. Everybody understands where we're going, right? Okay. Sir, you had a question. Yes. Yes. That's bingo. I like that. That's that's great. That's great. Good deal. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a question. Yes, sir. Question on the floor. So my team, two years ago, shot up to the Secretary of Army uh, uh, a white paper mm -hmm. related to Diomi, which is a great tool. Uh, but there's a lot of other command climate related issues that really can't be captured in the 10 additional. Yes. Uh, the, you know, is there harm in trying to make this a broader? This, I'll just call it a climate survey, which the Diomi is uh, core to it. Yes. Expand it to other areas, and mm -hmm. the reason is the Sec Sec Army hasn't gotten back yes. uh, with that. And I know there's been discussion around it, so mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your thoughts on that. Yes, I can. Um, there are many organizations, not even military, that, that are actually trying to go to this, and that's one of the problems that they are facing. It's very difficult, though, to create that kind of survey all-encompassing, because if you have 50 questions here, you start putting the leadership and the management and all that stuff in there, now you're gonna have a survey that may be 100, 200 questions. So when you look at these, especially the 4.1, so in, within the 4.1, they tried to address that a little bit more. So if you look at those organizational effectiveness factors, that's why you see the list now is so much longer because of that issue. Because there are issues that you have, that you all have that are outside of the scope of equal opportunity and diversity and all of that kind of stuff. They're, le they're leadership issues, okay? But the 4.1 tries as best it can to address some of that. Okay. I haven't looked at 4.1, so. 4.1 is just, it, it's, it's out now, but for those of you, like if you've done one already, sir, you, you had the 4.0 or probably 3 point something. So those results are still coming back in. The next ones that you all do, if you're up now, you're gonna be doing 4.1. And it's only about 50 questions now as, as opposed to what it used to be, almost 100. So, yes, those are some of the, and see, here's another thing which you can do, sir, with something like that. When you have focus groups, or if you have focus groups, now that's when you can sit down with that practitioner and say, hey, listen, I understand, you know, we have this survey, but I have some other issues that I think are being affected. Do you mind asking about some of those questions? Absolutely, we can do that. Absolutely. Great questions. Anyone else? We good on time, Captain? Yeah? All right. Okay. Well, listen, I want to thank you all for your participation. It's been great. This is my first and last conference, so this has been a good one. If I don't see you all within the next day or in the next few months, bless you all in your career. Remember, everything that you do is going to affect someone else's career. So just try to help us and do the best job you can with leadership and call on us, those people that are out in the EO field. If you ever need anything, my name is Gary Richardson. I'm right at Diomi. All you have to do is call, call the number and you'll get me. You'll, somebody will track me down. To give you my desk number is a waste of time because I'm never at my desk. I'm somewhere doing this. So if you need me, by all means, contact Diomi and I'll... Uh, do what I can for you. Thank you all for your participation. See you later. Thank you.